This is a topic I'm sure um, not many think about or, or consider when they're watching their anime, but it's going to largely cover uh, just power lines as they appear in anime. It's um, uh, they're not really they don't generally mean a whole lot inside the context of an anime, but they're generally scenery. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about what power lines mean to Japan, uh, contrasting that a bit with uh, the West, how we think about power lines and see them overhead. Uh, we'll dig into some analysis of some what are considered strong power line anime, where, where they actually use power lines thematically. Um, those types of anime are pretty rare. Uh, Japan, in particular, has a pretty uneasy relationship with power systems and uh, power in general. Uh, we'll dig into some of the Fukushima disaster and how, what kind of impact that had on uh, the creative schools of thought that uh, exist in Japan today, because it had a very large effect. Um, it won't. This this w is meant to be pretty surface level, but uh, it, it, we are going to do some power systems. Uh, work. There will be a test after this presentation, so make sure you're taking notes. All right, so first, introductions, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Gene. I'm a power engineer. I graduated from the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, I, do, I, I work at a company called Peak Reliability. They're the reliability coordinator uh, for the Western Interconnection. And the Western Interconnection uh, basically based on what you see on the map, extends from British Columbia and it includes every state, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Nevada, California, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and the Panhandle or Baja area of Mexico. Uh, so that that is what we call Peaks Reliability Coordinator Operating Area. Uh, it's the largest geographic reliability coordinator area. Uh, reliability coordination generally entails ensuring sort of compliance. We don't actually do any, operate any of the switch gear uh, directly, but uh, we can uh, interact with such companies as like Bonneville Power Administration, if you're in Washington, uh, California ISO, if you're in California, XL Energy, uh, Tri-State, <laughs> uh, the list goes on and on. We have, I think, approximately 80 to 100 entities that own transmission in our area. Uh, but we monitor the whole thing. Uh, in general, those entities, uh, typically referred to as balancing authorities, just look at their own sort of power lines in their own specific area and the size and range uh, vary widely. Um, one of the most important things that a reliability coordinator does is basically prevent blackouts. If, if a blackout happens uh, due to a reliability coordinator, like on a reliability coordinator's watch generally, that reliability coordinator is going to be bankrupted out of existence. And that's exactly what led to peak reliability being formed, directly or indirectly. Uh, peak reliability was formed after, uh, out of another reliability coordinator called the WEC Reliability Coordination. Um, it's WEC Reliability Coordination. WEC was the planner uh, that for the Western Interconnection. It's basically what they do is they just ensure that like, you know, the the interconnection is sound from a planning perspective, but uh, the big disconnect comes uh, between um, planning and operations. So operations deal specifically with the day-to-day, week-to-week uh, operation of the power grid. So it's generally the one trying to manage uh, force outages like sudden outages, um, disasters. Uh, we're gonna dig into some of that much later in the presentation. But uh, lastly, peak reliability largely deals with what we call the bulk electric system. So we're going to dig now into the Power Systems 101 portion of this. Uh, so generally how a power, power uh, grid operates is that you, know, you have your generation, which is usually large machines, like you can think of large jet engines for like natural gas or large boilers. Uh, generally it's a steam reaction that induces current, like to turn a generator that produces current, as opposed to a motor which takes in power to, um, you know, uh, move something, turns electrical energy into a mechanical energy, whereas a generator turns mechanical into electrical. 
Uh, so there's a generating station, and then it goes into a, what we call a generator step-up transformer, or a GSU, uh, and then that gets turned into ultra-high voltage, like put onto ultra-high voltage lines. Uh, usually in the 230 kV, uh, it, I think we consider 115 kV as bulk electric, uh, all the way up to 500 kV for alternating current power. Uh, but it can go as high as 765, those lines exist. Um, and DC lines go as high as 1000 megawatt, or er, kill, kilovolts, what have you. Um, and then uh, like it gets transmitted and then it reaches substations, what we call distribution substations, and then it gets transformed down again, so stepped down to uh, pretty standard um, like, you know, your home voltage, which is like 120 volts. Uh, some commercial, like large machines, maybe operate at 69 kilovolts. Uh, just basically whatever the customer needs as far as voltage goes. Uh, in general, what we see in anime is largely distribution vo voltage level, which is like your 22 kV, sometimes it's 44, 69 kilovolts. Uh, that's, that's the kind of stuff you'll see in anime. Uh, we are going I am going to show you some examples of where they do have bulk electric size uh, power lines. There are some anime that feature them pretty prominently. Um, but in general, what you're going to see is distribution level. So, uh, like I said before, the anime, typically when you see power lines, you're not really meant to think about the power lines. Uh, Digibro says this, and I disagree 100%. But I can't deny the reality that most of the time it's just scenery in the background. Um, it, it's it's not really you're not really meant to think about it too much. So power lines generally get a bad rap. Uh, you'll you'll kind of see them there for like a few seconds, and then the scene will move on. It's kind of used as a transition. I personally like it more than like the usual panda sky or or you know just a picture of some fields or whatever. But yeah, like you'll every once in a while you'll see some, some uh, what we call, uh, in this particular picture, uh, distribution transformers. Uh, a lineman would refer to them as like pots because they're usually full of like an oil-like substance to keep the uh, coils cool. It transforms it down from like a 69 or a 22 kV down to distribution 120 volts, 240 volts, whatever, again, whatever the customer needs. So, in general, I can I consider this one a pretty good picture. Parasite, the Maxim, did a good job with its power lines, I would say. Uh, but there are some anime that just get it completely wrong. So I have uh, here on the slide uh, two two anime, uh, but they generally are meant to display the kind of the same thing. I, I don't know how well you can see it, but on the left we have orange, and on the right we have flying witch. Uh, Flying Witch is my go-to example for bulk electric drawn completely wrong. It's, uh, there, there are, uh, let's see, I count eight lines on there. Um, in general, uh, most bulk electric or distribution uses three lines, what we call three-phase power, alternating current. Uh, but if you have eight, you know, you can't really divide that by three. So it's not really uh, feasible to have eight lines such as that, and it, it's frankly kind of could be disastrous. Uh, at best, what I can assume happens is that it has two shielding wires uh, at the very top, but they're, they're for some reason they're insulated from the tower. Uh, the reason we have those insulators is so that they don't make contact to ground because power only goes one way and that's straight into the ground. Um, if you don't have a path to ground, you basically don't have electricity moving at all. Uh, so, so it's plausible, but completely unlikely. And if you really want to dig into it, like it actually does make contact to the tower. It goes basically around the insulators. So, Flying Witch, I, I've torn up that poor show good enough. It's a decent show, decent anime, but it, it, the, that particular shot uh, bothered me a great deal. So to contrast this with orange, uh, again, I'm not sure you can make it out, but it's it's like a perfect example, and it, it has a three phase as well as the four four uh, lines on the top there. As you can see, there are four on the upper half. Uh, that's what we call three phase plus a neutral. 
So it, those are uncommon for bulk electric, but it's plausible. Like it could exist, it could happen. I, you know, I haven't been to Japan. I, I can't speak directly for where what the basis for that picture is, but it's actually correct. So what you actually see is it comes up to the tower and makes and, and comes into contact with the insulator, loops around underneath the uh, you know tower structure, and then continues on to the to the next tower, and it even has that. Um, uh, what we call the shielding wire. And that shielding wire is usually a neutral, so maybe current will be flowing along it, but most of the time in modern power transmission systems, you'll see, you'll use that shielding wire to transmit data. That will be your uh, real-time flows on the power lines, or it, it will be like, you know, whatever sort of telemetry you want to collect, uh, voltage, real-time voltage, we can collect real-time megawatts flowing across the line, all that good stuff. So I think I can't talk enough about how good Orange is. We'll, we'll talk more about Orange later on in this presentation, but it's, it's by far one of my best representations of the bulk electric system. It was like in just about every episode of Orange. So it, now we're gonna dig into a little more of the uh, engineering and design, um, contrasting east and west. Uh, so in the West, we generally don't like seeing our power lines. Um, I have on the slide NIMBY, which stands for not in my backyard. No one likes having a substation in their backyard. It, it like, you know, distracts from the scenery or distracts from, you know, whatever else you're trying to look at when you're looking out your window. Um, in general, uh, uh, largely the public doesn't like it, but I actually, uh, when I lived out in uh, Western Colorado, uh, we lived in a house that was directly underneath a 345 KV line. I found out that was the uh, uh, parachute rifle 345 KV line. I would later find out, and that thing buzzes like crazy. Like, like uh, it makes like a distinct, very distinct buzzing noise, uh, like cackling. Uh, we'll dig into what that noise is, but uh, in general, uh, what we have is an alternating current, 60 hertz, uh, and uh, or 60 cycles, whatever you want to call it, uh, alternating current transmission system. Uh, in the west, we have two large high voltage DC lines, uh, Samar Salilo and uh, Intermountain to uh, uh, Intermountain. It, it connects Utah to uh, Los Angeles. But uh, yeah, it's it's the presentation nerves. I can't actually recall what uh, what it, what the two substations are. But like any other day, I'd know for sure. So, well, so, yeah, starting. Yeah. So in, in Japan, though, uh, largely influenced by the West, the top half I believe is 50 hertz, and the bottom half is 60 hertz, um, and they have pretty much no concept of NIMBY or very little. Uh, they pretty much put power lines wherever they need them to be. So you'll typically see them in the middle of farmland, in the middle of towns, very large towers with like maybe 12 lines, like three groups of three phases of power lines just right in the middle of a city, crisscrossing uh, everywhere. And uh, yeah, I think Orange was a very good representation of that. Again, I can't talk enough about how good Orange was. Um, and uh, it, it, I, I uh, also have a picture of Time Travel Shoujo here uh, with a picture of anime Ben Franklin. Uh, he, he was... Uh, time Travel Shoujo is interesting because it was like the Eastern sort of view on the history of electricity, which is like very competitive. It's very, um, you know, uh, it was basically a, a, or a power struggle, literally, to uh, get like, you know, power to like residential customers and, you know, make a lot of money. But like you know, it portrays them as very, you know, conscious-minded, public-minded, and, and uh, very, you know, generally good-willed people. But if you know the history of of, uh, of uh, Thomas Edison and Nikolai Tesla, it was bloody. <laughs> like you know, it wasn't it wasn't kind. They were very mean to each other. Um, and frankly, time travel showed you if, if I could offer criticism, I wish it focused on James, uh, James Maxwell, who was. I consider the grandfather of modern electricity. All right, so now we're going to talk a bit about Fukushima and what kind of impact that had on fiction for Japan. It, it was a huge deal. I mean, the greatest natural disaster. I can't, I can't like 
post, post videos of how horrible this disaster was. And, you know, Fukushima basically turned into a ghost, ghost town. Um, they, uh, I think some TEPCO officials before the disaster occurred uh, referred to a disaster at Fukushima as two to three times worse than uh, Chernobyl. One of the worst possible things that could happen. But in reality, if, if you ask me, based on the disaster I read from both, uh, Chernobyl was probably worse because it was a nuclear meltdown and uh, <laughs> nearly exploded. Uh, Fukushima, I mean, they also came close to that, but you, you still had radiation spillway. I would rate them about the same. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you had everybody leave Chernobyl, and everyone left Fukushima, and they had to basically redo the entire city. Um, Chernobyl is, uh, n is actually uh, safe now to enter. Uh, there are some parts that are obviously still dangerous, but I believe they've finished replacing all the topsoil. Uh, they're doing the same process in Japan and Fukushima. Uh, but creatively, what that led to was shows like Dimension W, uh, I Have Big Order up there right below that. Uh, generally, it was just kind of a fear of power, uh, just like too much, like, where is it coming from? Have we been too greedy? Uh, uh, Dimension W in particular portrays a world where everyone has free access to power. Uh, some some good-willed guy that's kind of like a... Uh, the modern uh, uh, version of uh, the guy that owns like Tesla Motors, uh, Elon Musk, like providing power for everybody, and he's like seen as like the savior of, of their culture and all these great things. But unfortunately, they're tapping into this mystery dimension where where like eldritch horrors exist and unleashing them upon the world. Uh, Big Order is also a bit of a stretch because uh, I mean, basically, the kid wanted ultimate power, but then he like destroyed Japan and the world in the process, and he deeply regretted that, but then he like does it anyway, he keeps doing it. But uh, yeah, largely uh, fear of power, fear of the unknown kind of came out of Fukushima. And uh, if you read about Fukushima, a book I recommend is uh, Japan, The Paradox of Harmony. It's a very scathing review of Japanese culture. Uh, I'll read you a quick excerpt too. Um, so, yeah, there is little doubt that the nuclear disaster was exacerbated by TEPCO's false belief in safety, or Anzen Shinwa, the myth of safety. It simply did not believe that a severe nuclear ex accident could happen, and its nuclear plant operations had been based on this false sense of security. The company did not train workers or contractors at Fukushima Daiichi, or at its other nuclear power plants, to handle a nuclear crisis with multiple failures. Uh, the employees did not even have a useful emergency manual to follow. Had they undergone rigorous safety and emergency training at TEPCO, they could have dealt with the crisis more effectively. Indeed, serious human errors took place throughout the crisis. For example, the temporary coolant systems were halted, which contributed to the meltdowns. So uh, the big key there, too, was that they just simply didn't consider it. And actually, it goes on to say that uh, the company worried that training for severe ex accidents might suggest the possibility of severe accidents. Um, as an aside, uh, that's actually a stark contrast to how we consider accidents here in, in, in the West. Uh, the largest uh, nuclear uh, power plant in the Western interconnection is Palo Verde in Arizona, and one of their contingency plans is for an alien invasion. So it's just a, just a kind of huge contrast there. Uh, I, I would say that the Japanese would consider that, uh, that we're giving name to the possibility that an alien invasion could occur. Um, so that's, that's a pretty scathing review of Fukushima and uh, like a huge, like, like this book doesn't mince words. It's extremely like, <laughs> I don't even, a scathing of, of Japanese culture in general that led to basically all the things that uh, the West considers wrong with their culture today. Wrong, um, I, I remain pretty uh, neutral on this. Uh, because, yeah, I, I want to contrast this with another nuclear power plant that was near the epicenter of the uh, tsunami and earthquake, uh, the Onagawa nuclear power plant. It wasn't owned by TEPCO, it was owned by uh, a separate uh, independent company, and um, it was actually closer to the epicenter of the earthquake. Uh, its walls were built 17 meters high. Uh, Fukushima actually was 25 meters, and then they cut it off. Like, they cut off 
uh, a huge part of their wall uh, based, uh, again, you know, it's in the book, based on uh, the thought that they needed better access to the yeah, reactors, yeah. the maintenance, etc. Um, and they considered 10 meters high enough, and we all know that it wasn't. Uh, and uh, what's also kind of funny about Onagawa is that it was actually used as a shelter. It actually shut down immediately after, after the earthquake hit. And uh, then they're like letting people in, like they're like, come on in, you know, we have blankets, we have workout centers, you know, it was used as a, as a place of safety and shelter. And uh, yeah, it was just a better engineered plant. And I think it would be a disservice to the Japanese to uh, not include Onagawa as a part of this narrative of Fukushima Daiichi. So all that being said, what the hell were we supposed to take from all of that? Uh, I mean... Sound engineering meets, uh, you know, uh, uh, planning for the worst. And, uh, you know, ultimately we feel that uh, in terms of disaster, there should be no expense spared. Um, you know, you could read all about TEPCO's horrible operating philosophy, the, the uh, lobbying they did to justify why they didn't do anything wrong. Like, it's just a long string of excuses and terrible terrible lies, but uh, when you look at Onagawa, you, it's, it's hard to say that, to like paint with a broad brush that all of Japan is like that. It's just simply not true. So, to contrast these two kind of schools of thought, we're going to dig instead into two anime I think best discuss this kind of fear of power and like the fear of connectedness versus uh, connecting and, um, you know, like basically having a power interconnection. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, speaking as an operator for a wide area interconnection, the, the largest geographically, I'm obviously going to be biased a bit more towards interconnections over, say, microgrids or like, you know, small scale sort of uh, distribution networks. Um, th those exist because they're feasible, like Alaska generates its own power, it's not part of a larger interconnection, it's a smaller distribution. But uh, let's let's dig into two of my favorite examples. I, I say postmodernism versus modernism. It's not, those don't particularly deal with those two themes, but it's basically the idea that, you know, um, it's worth it to pursue this for a grand narrative versus it's not worth it to pursue, you know, wide area of grids because, you know, we can't really trust it. Um, so, oh, what I have is a picture on the left of Serial Experiments Lane. Uh, it's a bit hard to make out on the slide, but, you know, there are the bulk electric ones in the background. And in the foreground, you can see the typical distribution that we were talking about. Orange almost exclusively showed pictures of bulk electric. Uh, one of my favorite pictures, I think that's from episode 12, is where it's just that picture of the giant pylon. Uh, and that's, that's an example of actually... Um, three groups of three phases of uh, uh, power lines as well as a shielding wire. I can't, I can't talk enough about orange and I'll get a chance to later. So let's start with Serial Experiments Lane. Um, one of the major sort of things that happens every episode, I mean you could start obviously with the very beginning where it says, you know, present day, present time, you know, uh, I forget what the actual Japanese is right actually. Literally only watch the dub, but then it cuts to like shots of uh, of power lines, and, and they're like buzzing, and uh, the buzzing is uh, I feel like they use the wrong sound effect for lane, but what that buzzing is is what we call corona loss. Uh, it's basically where the line meets the insulator, the, where the insulator is attached to the greater structure. Uh, there's actually a small amount of loss where it kind of dissipates off the line in like a circular sort of look. I don't know, it looks, looks like circular around the, where the insulator makes contact with the line and it creates a buzzing noise. And you can actually visually see this corona effect if it's um, foggy outside, high humidity, um, and the higher the voltage of the line, the better, the better you can see it. It looks like a kind of blue uh, sort of halo around the, uh, the uh, power line. But yeah, like... like uh, Serial Experiments Lane did that, and it also included like you know like people talking, like communication, uh, connecting to other people. Uh, I feel like Serial Experiments Lane uh, talks a lot about the fear of being overly connected to people. This is 
typically they, they dig into like the reality, like disconnecting between reality and, and existing in like this figurative space. The line, I think, is what they refer to. The, the line? Yeah. The wire. Thank you. Yeah, so, and like, you know, they, they leave this physical existence and they exist on the wire. Uh, connected to all human beings or human life and, and like we we basically exist in these two spaces and Lane wasn't really the god of those spaces they, they later find out sorry I should have mentioned that this is huge spoilers for serial experiments Lane it's it's a pretty moody anime uh, but but it generally paints it in a very negative light um, it because like you know there's these people that commit suicide and you know people mourn that um, but at the same token there are people that are just completely emotionally disconnected from a lot of it. They're like, well, do you know what happened to What's-Her-Face? Well, I don't know, but she's sending creepy emails, and that's messed up. Uh, so, yeah, Serial Experiments Lane, uh, I think, paints that connectedness in a negative light, because Lane is, like, hugely influenced by this. Like, as soon as she gets... <laughs> I forget what that computer is called that she gets it, but, like, yes. like the navvies? Yeah, yeah. So she's, like, instantly connected, and then it's, like, just this this struggle, like, a, a race to, like, get, like, the ultimate computer or whatever so she can achieve, like, you know, uh, uh, godliness or, or what, what have you, and, um, yeah, so, uh, but I think if you want a kind of neutral view of, like, that kind of connectedness, I always recommend Ghost in the Shell. Uh, it, Ghost in the Shell is more about, like, information, like, information sharing, and, uh, you know, uh, it, I, I'm not advertising for the new Ghost in the Shell, but really for the classic one. Uh, it ends on a completely neutral note. Like, it says, you know, they introduce this being that's, like, the ultimate being born from information, and it marries this sort of ultimate cyborg, and then it kind of shrugs and says, well, it, it happened, and this show is over now. Or, this movie is over now. I, I, I should say that this is the... I'm talking about the movie and not a standalone complex. And that I this is totally flippant analysis based on my understanding of uh, power grids, but I, I feel uh, for the purposes of everybody it, it would be useful to hear that because nothing I've read really talks most about like power lines when in serial experiments land when it's a major part of the theme. It's it's in every single episode again. So that's serial experiments lane. Um, the hazards of that is that we basically just kill ourselves and that it's all pointless and we should all just hurry up and reach the uh, Singularity. Uh, the singularity, yeah, yeah, basically that. <laughs> so now let's contrast this with Orange. Orange is a show that came out in uh, 2017, an anime, but the manga started in 2012. Uh, I think both of these shows are interesting because uh, Serial Experiments Lane uh, came out in 1999. Uh, yeah, I need to go back. Yeah, and... Um, and, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this, too. So the producer of Serial Experiments Lane, Oeda, uh, he actually intentionally meant for uh, Americans and Japanese to read two different themes from Serial Experiments Lane. He wanted to create a, uh, a, a contest of ideas. Uh, the Japanese would see it one way and Americans would see it another. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that is, but uh, I like to think that uh, uh, Western thought is very... Um, modernist in, in its ideas, like that it, it speaks to a higher purpose, uh, whereas the Japanese are very are more communal. That's all assumption. I don't really want to dig too much into that, but the, what I wanted to mention was that Oeda really intended for American audiences to read something different from Serial Experiments Lane than uh, Eastern audiences. So, anyway, uh, Orange. Uh, Orange is interesting because it is post Fukushima. Uh, the manga started in 2012, I believe March of 2012, so exactly one year after Fukushima sort of took place, and then the anime was only recently adapted last year. But it's a very modernist in its kind of ideals, that the idea that if we are connected to one another, we can basically help one another. Um, so, spoilers for Orange, uh, it deals very explicitly, explicitly with suicide again, much, much like Lane did. Uh, they introduce this character, who um, is a new student at a school, and he doesn't know anybody, and he, if day one, this is episode one, he mysteriously just goes absent for like weeks at a time. And later what we find out is, spoilers, what we find out is that his mom had killed, himself, killed herself, and uh, later on he also considers suicide. 
And, uh, and so what, the, what it refers to is like, you know, all these letters, uh, future, the future of these students send to their past selves and they're try like, trying to figure out what it is that like, the, their future selves want them to do. And basically it's all about helping this character, Kakebu, uh, kind of deal with this kind of huge emotional trauma he's gone through. Um, and it speaks largely again about, I think, connectedness, that how connectedness and how we're kind of all in this together. Uh, those are pretty modernist schools of thought, uh, still communal, um, and, and it's very trusting. At the same time, like all these characters in, in Orange are extremely different. Um, they're all sort of uh, doing their own thing, and like they're trying to wedge Kakadu into their like social circle, and it's it's honestly doesn't seem to be going well for much of the series. Um, but uh, it's gorgeous, features. Uh, power lines in every episode again, much like Serial Experiments Lane, and uh, yeah, it's just sort of, sort of a, 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 a sort of rooting for for connectedness, I would say. Um, but you know, I, I I would encourage everyone to kind of watch it themselves and draw their own conclusions um, on what kind of orange is about, because it it is kind of uh, a Rorschach test for like you know how we see ourselves and how we see each other. So. That's, that's like it. So what is it that makes a great power system? What is it that makes good engineering of a, uh, an, inter an interconnection? And uh, basically, uh, speaking from myself, who you know, works with like, the largest interconnection, it's just gigantic geographic area, like different people operating to their own sort of philosophies and, and like, you know, doing their own kind of thing. Uh, the interconnection has largely benefited from being connected to one another. Uh, there, there have been cases where they've tried to break off and form their own reliability coordinator. Alberta actually successfully did this, but they were kind of radial and Canadian. So they kind of did their own thing. And, uh, uh, but the rest of the interconnection kind of still stays under the same umbrella. Um, largely, uh, it's, I would argue that it's improved reliability. I mean, there, there are cases where there is specific protocols where if there's an energy shortage in an area, um, other areas are supposed to, by, by the rules we set up, uh, the standards for an interconnection, are supposed to help each other out. Uh, so what we, what we call the interconnection is the great flywheel. Uh, basically, if one side goes down, the rest of the side picks it up, maintains, you know, power, transient stability, non-transient, uh, uh, sorry, I should say steady state stability. Um, in general, uh, it's been better off for it. Um, like, yes, there are blackouts, but those are like sort of contained areas where we've identified specific engineering uh, where a blackout could occur. Like, there, we've identified specific circumstances where a blackout condition could occur, and you know, we mitigate that every single day in operation. Um, and then, you know, uh, the, the big hot topic, too, is uh, renewables versus non-renewables, uh, coal, natural gas, etc. Um, I can't speak to the environmental impacts. I think largely a lot of, some people strongly believe that, you know, coal is causing global warming and, uh, you know, the carbon emissions. I think the scientists are pretty much all in agreement that uh, global warming is caused by carbon emissions and all that stuff, and that way we need to embrace renewables right away. Uh, um, and uh, the, there are very specific engineering challenges to that, what we call a synchronous grid versus a uh, uh, inverter-based. Uh, all renewables, wind, I can't actually include water. Water is not uh, inverter-based, it's actually asynchronous. Like the water, flowing of water actually turns, turns a turbine which generates electricity. So that's synchronous, a synchronous machine. but. Uh, uh, the uh, the solar panels. What those? When I say an inverter, what that means is uh, it takes in like DC and then it turns it into AC. It inverts the power so that it you know goes up uh, up and down in a sine wave. It, it, it pushes power back and forth. Um, there are very specific and difficult engineering related things that affect reliability related to that. And I've actually I've actually got an example on the next slide here for you of what that looks like, what that challenge looks like. So we're closing up here. Uh, so mark your calendars because 2017 has a very special event coming up in August 21st. We're already well aware of it. 
It's the total solar eclipse across the United States. It's, it comes right in front of the sun at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight on the western coast, and it's going to cover all those solar panels right up. We're not going to get anything out of them. Uh, it's, uh, it's our reliability concern that we have uh, at a peak. Um, uh, California ISO is already planning for it. They have the largest amount of solar generation in the interconnection, what have you. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a huge event. It's going to affect reliability, and it's really going to put the interconnection that we have to the test. And I can't really say what's going to happen, because this has only happened one other time to a major interconnection. It's happened in Europe. And uh, they made out all right. They were, <laughs> from what I understand, they relied largely on uh, France's nuclear generators. Um, but that's just kind of my uh, innocuous understanding of that event. Um, overall, they, they kept the lights on. And uh, they, they speak to, um, in general, that the load was much lower for that day because people were just outside. They wanted to see a total solar eclipse. It's the coolest thing ever. So uh, yeah, we, we've got that coming up August 21st. Look forward to it. And uh, you can count on me to do my part to try to keep the lights on. Uh, but I, I can't take any sort of individual credit for this because there are a huge amount of players, like I said, hundreds of entities, hundreds of companies that operate their power systems. Uh, they're going to be doing a lot of the hard work, too. So. Um, that's all I have. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures from Bakken Monogatari. It's just a skirt attached to a power pole. Um, and now I can open it up to questions. We've just about hit the 40 minute mark on this presentation, but um, any questions at all? The difference in implementation of the uh, safety systems for Onigawa versus Fukushima Daiichi, um, it, is there an appreciable uh, difference in the time between when the two plants were uh, first constructed or completed? Very good question. Um, I have no idea regarding that. I think I'll have to look it up. But yeah, uh, I, but the big difference between the two is that it was two separate companies. Um, TEPCO did Fukushima, and uh, I actually don't have it written, but a different company did uh, Onagawa. Um, I don't know time frames. I think they were built nearly the same time, but uh, I, I, I'll have to look that up. But yeah, uh, that that is the major difference that I can cite right now is two very se separate companies with very separate sort of methodologies. Yep. But yeah, very important differences because <laughs> you know Fukushima doesn't really exist now, but Onagawa, uh, they actually. Uh, Took on took on a, a quite a few. Uh, um, they got a, a, quite a few government subsidies for keeping the lights on and you know doing a good job, basically uh, comparable to what Tepco got for for Fukushima. And uh, yeah, uh, it, that is basically an economic stimulus for for Onagawa. But yeah, no, it's 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 very interesting. It still is very interesting. But yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't answer your question directly. Um, also, with regard to um the contrasting interpretations of uh, connectedness between serial experiment slain and orange. Um, it seems as though one takes the more pessimistic view of our current circumstance versus the uh, more optimistic view of our current circumstance. I agree. Where ultimately do you see um, systems like the internet? those uh, superstructures, as it were, mm -hmm. um, where do you see them trending towards? Towards the more optimistic or into the more pessimistic line? Yeah, I think uh, you can't really stop the spread of ideas. So I think we are headed towards uh, the uh, ghost in the shell future where everyone's just kind of connected to the internet and there's free flow of ideas. Um, I just think that there's huge economic advantage, um, a huge sort of cultural advantage to open open access and, and free flowing of ideas, but it's it's a very painful sort of transition that would occur. Um, I think uh, that it, it's just it's a it's a hazard. It is a hazard, but it's um, it, it's ultimate an ultimate good. And I, I I again that's my bias coming in where I strongly advocate for interconnectedness and free flow of ideas. Um, uh, and I think the United States is a good example of that. Uh, again, 
I'm, I'm biased because I'm American, but <laughs> but yeah, like I see us headed towards that uh, free, completely interconnected future, whether we want it to or not. I think it's just kind of an in inevitability. Um, but yeah, those those are those are my personal thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, good good question. Good question. You're making me take a stance on these things, and I try to keep it pretty neutral. All right. Yeah, any other questions? Any other questions? So how, how come half of Japan is 50 hertz and half is 60 hertz? Yeah, so uh, when America came in and said, uh, open the country, like, you know, uh, stop having it be closed, that meant Britain and America would come in there and trade, and Britain is a 50 hertz system and America is a 60 hertz system, so ultimately we just compromised and said, all right, we get this half, 60 hertz and you can get this half at 50 hertz and we'll just see who's better and like like Japan was kind of ultimately a petri dish and an experiment on on uh, those two different sorts of uh, systems and I think ultimately the conclusion is they're exactly the same like there's there's very minute and pointless differences uh, none are related to reliability uh, I would say they're pretty much the same so if, you get, so if you're in like Okinawa and then you travel to Hokkaido in the north, is yeah. the outlet a different shape or do you just sort of oh, plug your stuff question. in and then it doesn't work? That's a good question. I, or it doesn't work more slowly. I think it could still work because you can transform it to um, a uniform, like a DC. You're turning it into DC anyway. Um, I, I, I'm actually not sure about that. I actually don't know. No, I'll, I'll look into it though. That's I I uh, yeah I don't know. I meant to ask Alex about that because he's actually been to Japan. He's been on both sides. So, but yeah, no, it's just a weird thing that that kind of occurred. Yeah, maybe it is fine. I know like some yeah. chargers say like fifty two sixty hertz. So maybe it's right. Just whatever. They just convert it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I I know it's a trivial thing to convert. Like you just. You, you can use some diodes to convert it to DC regardless, and you'll get so much mileage in terms of like watts out of your outlet. Um, yeah, it's completely trivial, I would say. Yeah. All right, uh, yeah. Which anime would you say best symbolizes your ideal power configuration? Oh, man. Uh, there are a few. Uh, Orange is still the best one. Um, like in recent memory too, like that was just always the, the hallmark of like a bulk electric. But yeah, like very few come to mind, especially in terms of thematic use. Um, I, I mean, I put a few throughout. I mean, I really like the way Bakemonogatari uh, portrays uh, power systems. I'm trying to remember which arc used it. Um, a lot, but Pokemon Guitari is a good one. Um, I I think it tries to do that thematically, but I haven't. Uh, Pokemon Guitari does a lot of things, uh, and uh, I my degree is in, in engineering. I, I I can't go into the analysis of like why they're there. Um, yeah, man, that's a tough one because a lot of them just have pictures of distribution, like the very low KV, and they do it very well. Um, uh, Amanchu is one that uh, I didn't don't have any pictures of, but Amanchu has really good pictures of uh, a distribution level system in most frames when they're outside. Uh, maybe not when they're going diving. Amanchu is the one about those that girl trying to open up and uh, uh, you know uh, through diving with uh, this this other girl and and yeah, like it's it's it, Amanchu does have its own flaws at the same time. Like I have I have a some problems with the way uh, some of the lines are drawn, but it, it generally does a good job. Uh, I think uh, it's very respectable. It's a very respectable show. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm drawing.